Yeah, Sam from The Sprouts. Uh, we're here today with uh, Neil Cocker from Cardiff Starts and... And Ramp, my own business, and also I'm a co-founder of TEDx Cardiff as well. Oh, fantastic. We're here to kind of discuss, as part of the What Matters series of interviews that you've seen on the website, um, economy, entrepreneurship, that kind of uh, jazz, I think, today. So I think let's get cracking with, is Cardiff a good environment for startups and young entrepreneurs? Yes, I mean, in in a word, yeah, I think it is, um, with a few caveats. I mean, first and foremost, we, we're very, very lucky we have a young, smart workforce. I think, you know, the Cardiff has, has got a below average age. A lot of that's to do with the, the great volume of students we've got in the city. So it means we have a high level of um, uh, graduate um, graduates available in the workforce, Um cost of running a business is pretty low here office space is really really cheap in comparison to London um, you know my my sort of friends and fellow entrepreneurs in London are always incredibly jealous of how little we have to pay in rent here and you know we we're very very close to London in effect you know if sometimes it feels like a, a pain in the bum to get up there but it's you know it's, it's two hours it's not the end of the world and yeah. I, you know I'm going to be up there by sort of mid-morning tomorrow um, so on the flip side, and the thing that makes it difficult is um, sometimes it's difficult to get access to finance, mm-hmm. uh, specifically in my sector, which is technology. Uh, we look for very often private equity money, which is uh, kind of, as you mentioned before, kind of like Dragon's Den scenario where someone takes a share of your business in return for some cash and you use that cash to really accelerate your business. And that works very, very well within the technology sector. Um, but there aren't that many technology investors in Wales. We're not a, uh, we don't have a huge history or legacy of technology in Wales in comparison to other parts of the UK. Um, we tend to be a post-industrial. So most of our rich guys tend to be like middle-aged white men in suits who made their money through legal or financial services or property or manufacturing. So, so when you go to them and tell them you want to build an iPhone app, their eyes very often sort right. of move in different directions and then <laughs> they, they go move away. So this lack of kind of uh, private finance, is this something you think that the public sector could possibly step into or there, is there another way we can tackle this? Um, there are some, I mean we have Finance Wales which is the Welsh Government's investment arm mm-hmm. uh, and they are making moves to try and uh, support the technology sector but fundamentally a lot of it is about whether you have the, the knowledge and the insight and what is often called the appetite for risk so those things are you need to understand the businesses in which you're investing and if you don't have uh, that understanding then you're probably not going to feel comfortable taking a risk on that business because any investing is risk yeah there's no such thing as a guaranteed thing mm-hmm. so uh so yeah so that's uh welsh government are trying to do that but it's not traditionally an area in which public sectors have uh, been able to intervene partly because it's public money yeah. and there's an argument, well, should public money be made, used to take those kind of risks mm-hmm. and investing in early stage business is is risky by its very nature. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a good question and I don't think anyone's 100% got the answer but generally public sector probably is not the, the ideal space in which for them to intervene. So we need the young people to get rich and then start investing their money back into tech. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's really uh, kind of come is 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 we what we need are younger entrepreneurs who've made their money and willing and have the time and energy to reinvest. We mm. need, you know, where is Mark? Where is Wales? Is Mark Zuckerberg coming yeah. from? Where is Wales? Is I mean, Bill Gates is technically an old guy now, but he, you know, his appetite for investing in you know smart small businesses is probably uh, still there. We don't have many people who are in their 30s let alone their 40s who are have exited a business made some cash and want to put put some time and energy back into them others okay slightly different tack now the bristol pound has been successful and it looks like cardiff is getting its own pound too is this good for the local economy and how can it be supported um, I think it's a great initiative. I, I, you know, I'm really supportive of anything that keeps money uh, local um, and and keeps the spending. I mean, I'm I'm really bad for spending money online. Uh, and there there are two kind of arguments here. There's like, well, you've got to digital is disrupting every industry, and so 
if look if if Amazon are going to offer me a better service than uh, you know going to offer me something to my doorstep and ten quid cheaper than walking into town to pick it up, then of course I'm going to choose Amazon, right? But there are good social reasons for spending your money locally, but obviously you can't blame people for go, going down the easy route. Um, so I think hopefully a local pound, a like Cardiff pound, would, would kind of maybe maybe help in that in some way. Um, and yeah, it is, but it's a tricky one. You know, your, your market forces in these kind of things, those massive economic forces are... Are really tricky things to get round, and um, but if you can generate your own local economy through a, a local um, currency, that'd be brilliant. Cool, yeah. It's really funny what you're saying about Amazon and stuff because I'm always like that with spillers. I always want to support spillers, yeah. but if I can just I can get the album, I get the MP MP3s immediately on my phone. Yeah. But then, but I still shop in spillers because I want to support the economy. So it's that balance, isn't it? It is, and it's really yeah. really tricky. I mean, I, you know, I was li I literally bumped mm. into Ashley who runs uh, spillers on Sunday night. And we had a very brief conversation. And, you know, I was congratulating on the fact that, you know what, they have been a huge success story when uh, pretty much, you know, 90% of other independent record shops in the UK mm. have just died. Uh, and Ashley and her team have done a brilliant job Absolutely. in keeping that going. Uh, and hopefully, um, you know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like you. I mean, I, you know, I listen to hours and hours of Spotify a day. I can't remember the last time I bought a physical yeah. CD. Um, so, but that doesn't help Ashley. But that doesn't mean that what Ashley and Spillers do isn't really important mm -hmm. and should just be pushed aside by the forces of the digital yeah. economy. So, actually, a Cardiff pound might really, re, you know, put put cash back into those businesses. Hopefully, anyway. I just thought that who would be on the Cardiff pound? We have Ninja, <laughs> yeah. Ninja, Toy Mike, Trevor. yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> all, all our greats, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah, with the with the, the, with the cone on his head. Yeah, exactly. No, it'll have to be the rugby ball in the wall now, wouldn't yeah, it? It's like that, so. that would be our, our kind of icon. icon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, transport in Cardiff is a very divisive issue. Plans for a South Wales metro system have been discussed in the news a lot. Do you think this would help the city as much as it's been said? Um, yeah, I mean, you're you're absolutely right. Transport is, is a very divisive issue, uh, and. <sighs> I don't know enough about the the metro plans to, and I, I don't th I think there are very very few people who understand really the the likely social and economic impact of, of such thing. But uh, as you and I were were talking about a while ago, you know, if it's taking people like the best part of an hour to get in to the city or to the city centre from relatively close by uh, suburbs such as Lan Rumney and whatever. And some of the closer uh, sort of valleys towns, of course, that will have an impact because it'll enable them to engage in uh, everything from shopping to the arts and the culture, commuting more effectively, uh, improve their quality of life, so they're not spending like two, three hours a day commuting. Um, and it will also give the city access to a greater and wider talent pool. You know, so if we're talking about the economy, you know, if you know that someone who normally would be stuck out in either Merthyr or the eastern fringes of the city or whatever and they can get into town quicker and they consider Cardiff a place in which they can now commute to and work then that's great for employers that's great for the economy because it just means you've got more access to talent more access to employees um, and you know there's a softer benefits as well it's like well you know of course for all the usual reasons most of the culture and art exists where the density of people is. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a shame that sometimes that isn't readily accessible to people who live further away. So anything that improves and cheapens the, the access of people outside the city to get into the city, uh, I'm all in favour of. I think you might probably answer the next question with, with that previous number, how would better public transport links improve the economy in Cardiff? Um, yeah, I mean, there's... There's kind of two elements to that. There's the local stuff, which we kind of touched on with the metro, yeah. and then there's the stuff that is about getting us to London, to Birmingham, to New York, to San Francisco, to Berlin. Um, so locally, I think, just in, inside the city, not even talking about the metro, but in, inside the city, I still think there are issues. Again, we were talking about Plan Romney, and that's kind of, that's in Cardiff. Well, yeah, it's the whole east of the city. There's, there's, 
Yeah, exactly. Unless you're, only, there's no trains. It's buses down Newport Road or nothing, yeah. really. Um, which is kind of uh, frustrating. A lot of these are kind of things, infrastructural things, of the way the city was set up, like hundreds of years yeah. ago. And you know, you could. I don't think anybody really could have predicted how quickly the city would grow, and that's something the council has got to work with, mm-hmm. uh, the, the work at how to be a growing city at this rate. Um, there's other issues about the fact that one of our greatest assets, Butte Park basically just chops the city in half Mm. and actually there's only really a couple of ways across the city city centre there's like right in front of the castle which you don't want to be doing at any time apart from like three o'clock in the morning when it's quite or five o'clock in the morning when it's quiet um because it's three yeah but yeah i I said three o'clock and they went "Ah, actually yeah it's probably not that quiet um but you know what i mean and then you've got the back of town down panath road and and that little complex of streets there but even that's not exactly an easy way you know sometimes it's just quicker to get on the link road and go all the way sort of around panath or round over the top and you know or try and get down to Western Avenue isn't it it's, uh, exactly so it's it's not you know it's not uh, it's not the easiest city to get across from one side to the other mm-hmm. but you know what I'd rather us have Butte Park than not yes so um, for me it's all about public transport uh, you know the th- people always talk about building more roads and my response is well if you build more roads there will be more cars to fill those roads. Yes. In 5, 10, 20, 50. However many roads you build, we'll just... They'll build, always fill them. We'll always fill them. Yeah. So why not think about smarter public transport links? Yes. And there's got to be a mix. And, you know, it, it's... It, we never... Obviously, nobody's ever going to relinquish cars entirely. And, you know, but... But, uh, but yeah, I think some innovative transport solutions. And that might be to do with open data. It might be to do with opening up all the data about our transport networks. You know, you look at something like, there's a great app I use whenever I go to London. It's called City Mapper. Mm-hmm. And pretty much anyone who spends any time in London has got City Mapper. And I think it's in a bunch of other major cities in the world. It uses smart data, real bus times, real train times. And literally you tell it where you are, where you want to go, and it will tell you the quickest way to go there. It will know whether there's traffic, whether there's delays on the trains, whether there's blah, blah, blah. It will tell you actually, you know what, for an extra five minutes, you could probably walk it and you'll burn 500 calories instead of, or you know, 100 calories instead of jumping on a bus and sitting there and checking Facebook for half an hour. So I use, likewise, I just use, I use Google Maps for that. And it's superb. I was, I was last night, so I was, I was going up to uh, somewhere in King Coyd, uh, to a friend's party. He didn't know how to get there. Just Googled it. It's a bus in five minutes. Go over that way. And you're thinking, yeah. I, used to, yeah, I used to have to get like a paper thing and <coughs> go to yeah. bus stops to get the paper yeah. thing. And it, the way technology is evolving, we can obviously use it much better yeah. and, and get around a, quick, a city faster as long as the infrastructure is there for us to get around the city. Exactly. Yeah. Education is really important if we are going to make sure we have a skilled workforce. What role can business play in working with schools and colleges? Um, well, I think you know the the obvious thing is there can be better dialogue to allow for more apprenticeships and placements and that kind of thing. That that's a, that's a, an easy easy fix. I think one one issue that uh, technology and digital struggles with is that we're a very, very fast-moving uh, industry, uh, but actually academia is quite slow-moving. You know, so a change in the syllabus can take literally years. Mm-hmm. Um, and and one, one point that's quite interesting is that, and it's something uh, Ken Robinson uh, said in his sort of famous TED Talk a handful of years ago, it's like, we're trying to educate kids now for jobs that don't exist yet. Mm. So when he... I think he was talking maybe about his daughter or something, and he was saying, you know, he he was talking about three years previously, the job social media manager did not exist. And now there are hundreds of thousands of people across the world with that job title. Mm-hmm. How do you educate someone for that if you don't know that in 10 years' time that job's going to exist? And it's actually going to be like... I would say that... You know, most people who work in an open environment, certainly almost everybody who works in the public sector, should have a good, solid grounding in social media. Yes. 
it's the kind of thing that maybe you and I, with the work that we do, we kind of take it for granted. Mm-hmm. But actually, there are some people who would have to be trained in that and yeah. whatever. No. Well, Prom Recovery, which is the charity that runs this route, does social media training for these very things because it is so important to, yeah. to the third sector and to the public sector to be able to communicate safely and effectively yeah. online. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of calls now for, you know, to totally um, uh, have this kind of flat hierarchy around uh, social media. So most public sector organisations probably have only a handful of people who are allowed to yeah. tweet on Facebook. Um, but actually the reality is there's an argument that why don't you open that up? Mm-hmm. And actually most people aren't stupid. Yeah. And most people know, you know, and it's about trusting you. If you 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 trust any member of your staff to go and meet a client, yes. so why would you not trust them to... I suppose the only issue then is having a consistent voice. Like some, of course. Some person sharing cat pictures of the other person's... Exactly. Yeah. Things. Exactly. You've got to have the policy in place, I suppose. So but then you have the policy and other things. Don't of you? course so, you do. Yeah. So you know, and, and and so, do you train kids for that from mm-hmm. the age of twelve, or you know? So, um, but yeah, certainly in terms of business, uh, businesses are always crying out for smart young uh, uh, people, and it's it's not even sometimes about the education. It's about have they got the right attitude? Because yeah. there's a sort of saying in recruitment: it's like you can. Uh, you recruit for attitude and then you train for skills okay. so you can it, yeah, it, you, it's that. much better to recruit someone who has no idea what they're doing but has got 100% the right attitude Yes, and train them that makes because sense, yeah. they, you'll get much much more from them in mm-hmm. the long run than someone who's got like the perfect CV but, but doesn't care or yeah. is not a cultural fit, fit. Yeah. exactly so, so you know there's, there's that kind of thing of like you know for me how do you train young people to work or run fast-paced work in fast-paced business environments, or or hopefully one day go on to run their own business? Yeah. And it, you know, I don't have those answers, but but it's difficult because academia, as a general rule, changes its syllabuses the way it works quite slowly. Yeah. The structures are already almost set in stone sometimes. Mm. Well, what I, what I think when I've kind of reflected on this after leaving school and university is it's not exactly what you learn in school. It's not important what you learn, but it's the ability to learn and to and to apply that. Because like I watch educating Cardiff, and one of yeah. the girls like, "What well, do you need for this theory for?" Yeah. Like, Whatever that's a bit, bit valuable in Cardiff. <laughs> um, I said, you don't need Pythagoras' theory because you're not going to probably go into engineering. What you need to do is able to see a place to use that kind of thinking. It's, it's, a being, it's being adaptable and using yeah. things you've learned in new situations. That's how I view it anyway. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've, of all the people I went to university with, the only ones who ended up using their degree uh, at, in their job were those who did a medical degree. So optometrists, yeah. doctors... Uh, you know physiotherapists so a, a medical science uh, type uh, thing so the majority of us it's just a case of a degree proves that you've got capacity to learn at a high level yeah. and also probably a, a high capacity for alcohol <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you should say that so I, was, I was in some student halls last night because one of our volunteers who right. volunteered there it was his birthday and it was just it was surprising they weren't drinking that much. Really? I was a bit like, what? 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 Your first years, you should be getting. My, yeah, uh, anyway. my... Then we went into town and found the ones that were drinking. Right, okay, so already. yeah, of course, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so that was a bit of an eye opener. Anyway, from, from booze to business districts, do you think a business improvement district is a good idea for Cardiff? What kind of things should we prioritise to help make Cardiff an even better destination? Um. Yes, business improvement districts or, or areas of sort of economic or you know business clustering are, are generally tend to be quite good, but you've got to they've got to be done in the right way. Yeah. Um, it's really easy just to stick a bunch of businesses on a business park like five miles out of the city so centre. That's, that's what one of these things is. It's just group of cheap buildings and facilities for the similar companies to come together. Right, is exactly. It? So, well, some of them are, some of them aren't. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of plans around the city for various bits and pieces. Yeah. Um, and I think people sometimes think that it's just a case of building cheap office space. Yeah. Um, and actually, people forget the human element of it. Mm-hmm. So uh, <clears throat> I think people like being around other like-minded people. And that's what stimulates 
collaboration and that's where new things happen so uh, Mark Cooper from uh, IndieCube uh, talks about accelerated serendipity by putting similar or like-minded people in the, in the same space you're giving them the opportunity to suddenly discover or innovate or collaborate um, in a way that perhaps they wouldn't if they happen to be on you know but you know so you know you have to sometimes it's not just about building cheap office space because that doesn't necessarily help businesses in the long run it helps in the short term yeah. it doesn't actually help them in the long run um, but also building a culture around those spaces which is again why these clusters have built up in so you look at Silicon Valley or Old Street Roundabout or all these places that have <clears throat> they're organic clusters mm. and you couldn't have designed them and built them from scratch they, that just wouldn't work there had to be there were certain other elements that fed into the success of those places. Some of it was about cheap office space. Some of it was about great coffee. Mm. Some of it was about being around artists. Some of it was around being around, you know, for Silicon Valley, a lot of it was about defence spending. A lot of the the original money in Silicon Silicon Valley in the 50s and 60s was basically DARPA, uh, uh, the American Defence Research Organisation. And then obviously that's fed into a... um, Silicon conducting uh, yeah. research and whatever, so that's where Silicon Valley came from. Yeah. Um, so you can't, but you can't replicate that because you know we has don't. To happen. Yeah, it has to. So there has to be and an organic. It's pretty sure. I remember reading an article about probably six months a year ago. We're, we're currently sat down in the bay, and I can see the coal exchange from here. And it was about how twenty years ago, maybe thirty years ago, there was like a media node in coal exchange, small independent companies that, for whatever reason through the coal exchange falling into dishes, yeah. it's kind of dissipated. But it's like, these used to be record studios, and, and like obviously the BBC have now kind of come near back to it, but like that's something that happened organically, yep. and we need to somehow get some cultural compost and try and get more of these exactly. naturally occurring things. So I, I know that actually, uh, I know that you know, there's obviously still discussions going on about the coal exchange, but, but for me that, this area is ripe. So this area is representative of many, many creative and digital clusters that have sprung up over the, over the years because it's a relatively cheap part of the city. Most of the offices aren't exactly like shining, polished glass and steel kind of thing. They're actually kind of a little bit rough and ready because people like us don't care about that. We just want somewhere that's kind of Wi-Fi, IKEA desk, <laughs> you know, yeah. white walls and close to a coffee Yes. Or a pub or whatever. And that's kind of what what's that's what is a stimulus for most uh, clusters. So um, I think the bay is a real natural cluster. So we but we do need a couple of anchor buildings. So whether that's like the stuff that's going on over in Porth Tiger mm. or something happens with uh coal exchange or it's got the Millennium Centre, but there's, there still needs to be something, and I, I don't quite know what that is. But, but yeah, in short, business improvement districts can be good if the culture is built in as well as just cheap office space. I think we're on to kind of manufacturing, shopping, all that kind of stuff. So Cardiff used to be an industrial city with lots of manufacturing. Now all have all we have are call centres and shopping. Do we need to bring back manufacturing? Um, it's difficult. I, I think I don't think you, unless you incent massively incentivize manufacturers to come back here, the chances are they're not going to come back here. Um, and uh, I don't necessarily think government investment uh, in subsidising manufacturing to come to Cardiff and the surrounding regions is probably the best way to spend cash. I'd rather have money spent on businesses that are locally owned and built that that stay here uh, and have anchors here rather than sort of just go spending five, ten years here and then disappearing as soon as they get a better offer in China or yeah. whatever. However, we do need a mixed economy. Any successful economy needs to be mixed. So, you know, um, I just don't think necessarily that we can rely on manufacturing as a, as a means of uh, supporting us in the future. I think... Cardiff and Wales in general uh, are in a unique, have a unique opportunity really to, to take advantage of their size, uh, of their potential for innovation, their young population, uh, and make this a 
a capital of knowledge economy and creative industries and, uh, and, and innovation, we're sort of ideally set up for that. Um, and focusing too much on traditional industries could mean that we end up chasing something that probably will never come back. Um, let's kind of look to the future. Let's use our, our, our inherent strengths and our size as well. Because we're small, we can innovate quickly. We can try stuff out, and, uh, and you know, whether that's from the policy level or the or the commercial level. Um, yeah, so, you know, I don't think uh, manufacturing is likely to ever be as big in Wales as it once was. And we do still have, we, we manufacture Clark's pies, Brains <laughs> yeah, beer. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly the food thing seems to be going yeah. off the hooks. Yeah. Sweet food stuff. You know, it's just, I know it's not quite manufacturing building cars and stuff, but no, we no. are still making things in this city. Absolutely. And, you know, you, you go a few, you go an hour west to like West Wales and you've got some really, really nice brands like Hyatt Jeans and, and that mm. kind of thing that do, uh, that do incredible stuff. So, yeah, I mean, you know, manufacturing will still will still always be here, but, uh, but yeah, I, I just don't see it being as big a part of our economy as it once was. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't, I don't think we should try to, to bring it back in that way. If it comes back, it comes back organically, I think is the, yeah. the idea behind that. But one thing we definitely do have an awful lot of is Cardiff has excellent shopping in the city centre. What can be done to ensure other shopping areas of our city are not left behind? Um, I think a lot of it is down to... Uh, I hate to use the word, but kind of branding. Those areas need to develop a kind of an identity. Um, so I live in Roth, and the shopping there is okay. Uh, it's not brilliant, but it's close enough to the city centre that if I want to go and get you know clothes or whatever, then I'll come into the city centre. But it has a really, really strong cafe and pub culture, um, and loads and loads of restaurants. So you know, there's a there's a bunch of us talking at the moment about. That great, they, you know, some people have called it the International Mile. So City Road and Cruis Road is like, you can get curries, North African, mm. Middle Eastern, you know, it's just loads and loads of restaurants and cafes where you can get amazing, amazing food. So ha- can, can we make that an equivalent of um, London's Brick Lane, for yeah. example, which is known worldwide for being basically the best curries on the planet, you know? Uh, You've got like the Curry Mile, haven't you? In Manchester, isn't it? Exactly. So how how do we, you know, and that again, there has to be something organic. You can't force those things. But if you find those strengths, if you find those natural kind of, you know, you know, I'm sure like if you go up to somewhere say like Radha uh, or um, actually somewhere more like Rabina, you know, there's probably a slightly more boutiquey kind of thing that mm. suits the local population a little better. Uh, you know, Roth is kind of a little bit kind of. Uh, more suited to the young the families, pot, students. Yeah, it's a real mix of stuff. But they've really got uh, cafes and restaurants nailed. Um, and they've got the culture <coughs> in Roth as well. I think you've got the Made in Roth Festival, Keep Roth Tidy. There's yeah. that kind of community already there. Just there is. And it's starting to develop its own kind of... Mm. It's, it's, it's got enough uh, density now that it's starting to develop its own identity. Um, yeah, so I love living in Roth. It's kind of a little bit dirty and smelly, but it's... It's kind of got a buzz about it, and stuff is happening. I, you know, the ro- made in Roth is happening literally this week or you know this couple of weeks. And I, you know, I, I love at the weekends just pottering around, and you got all the open house stuff coming this weekend. So um, yeah, I think it's about developing an identity and working out what is where your natural strengths are and, and playing to them. Well, what can be done to help web and digital businesses? Um, there's a lot there's a lot to do in this space uh, and I think we have a short window <clears throat> in which we can take advantage of that so given the growth that Cardiff is is going through that we talked about and the fact that it's got such high quality of life that we talked about uh, and the low cost of operation of a business we are in a really really unique or we're in a very very good position to to be a world-class digital cluster. Um, however, uh, we need to solve these issues around access to finance, uh, business support, and I think this is a kind of a, a, a bit of a crucial one. There are lots of very generic supporting services. So you've got stuff like uh, Business in Focus, Business Wales, then you've got all the private um, 
the the private sector support so you've got your kind of tax advisors and accountants and lawyers and all that kind of thing but actually what we don't have and for the reasons we talked about we don't have that middle layer of success previously successful technology entrepreneurs who can put their time and energy back in so you know it's kind of unfair to expect business in focus who provide a very general broad service because that's what they have to do they have to be available for any any business in Wales or whatever or South Wales it's unfair to expect them to know the ins and outs of what is really required to run a digital technical business or a technology business um, so finding ways I mean with Cardiff Start we we basically started running free workshops and getting people from London to come and run them right. because we you know fundamentally the knowledge isn't really in this city so what I'm hoping is there's a current crop of technology startups in Wales at the moment in South Wales mainly in Cardiff and Swansea and a, and a bit in Newport who are doing really really interesting things and what I hope is in five years time a bunch of those will have had success and as people are graduating out of universities as young people are deciding they want to start technology businesses as people are like I've got an idea for the next Facebook for the next Snapchat for the next whatever they don't go to a generic business service and are confronted by a 52 year old guy in a suit who talks to them about very very generic services uh, or, or things that kind of don't help them they don't accelerate so everything about technology and web businesses is learning quickly and getting to the next stage finding out what works if that doesn't work next you know we keep iterative kind of process which is why your Facebook wall has changed like five times in the last five years yeah. you know they didn't go you know if you opened a cafe you'd probably like paint the walls one colour sit the coffee machine in the corner and that's you for like the next five to ten years whereas Facebook there's new features every week and you know it, it, there's constant tiny small iterative changes yeah. because digital allows you to do that um, so you have to work in that culture but you also need people who understand that culture to advise you I just keep thinking back. Do you watch Silicon Valley? I do. I was watching I it today. The, I think the incubator. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Guildford's into incubator. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I was literally. What well, I'm halfway through watching uh, season two at the moment, and like I'm in the middle of raising investment for my uh, startup, and it's just so much of that rings true. It's just <laughs> like it's like somebody there must have been through that process to so. you know yeah. just to really so understand to, to nail it as well. Yeah. As just does, everything yeah. from the technical details to the term sheets and. All that stuff, the legals. I mean, they're currently building servers in their garage at the moment in season two. So, it's, uh, yeah, it's brilliant. Do you think programs like The Apprentice and Dragon's Den have made starting a business more fashionable? Do you think they encourage creativity and enterprise in young people? Um, generally, no. Um, in the same way that Big Brother isn't an advert for what it's like to live in a shared house, <laughs> uh, The Apprentice is not a an advert for what it's like to run a business. Yeah. For me, that show is a competition to demonstrate which of you is the the nicest psychopath. <laughs> I mean, they they are all you know. I haven't watched it for a couple of years, but when I did. It would, they were basically all awful human beings and it was just a competition to see which one could outwit the others yeah. that was it there was no you know I've met people who uh, almost every person I've met who is ten times more successful ten times more wealthy than any of the contestants on that show would ever be mm-hmm. and they're all lovely and helpful and supportive and um, yeah it's not that's not what business is about Dragon's Den is kind of is a bit better yeah. uh, in so far as at least it puts the ideas of creativity at the front and centre. It plays up to the TV a little bit, and so you know I know people who've been on it, uh, and you know those kind of three minute segments are edited down. They're like they're in there for like forty five minutes an hour, mm-hmm. so they record a hell of a lot of stuff to try and get the bits where the contestant kind of looks nervous or forgets their words or looks kind of excited or gets the deal or doesn't get the deal. Um, so you know, they, you know, I've literally been pitching my business to investors in the last seven days, and I'll be doing it again tomorrow. And it won't be anything like Dragon's Den. Yeah. But what it does do is it sh- it gives an opportunity to showcase good creative ideas, and also 
frankly, some of the ideas are so bad that hopefully you think there's like 17, 18, 25 year old, 30 year olds out there going, I can do better than that. Yeah. They've just got a hundred grand. I, I've got a better idea than that. So hopefully, you know, in some respects, but broadly, they're not, they don't, they're not in, um, and they're not truly representative of what entrepreneurship is about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't think they're always helpful. Cool. Right, I think we're on to our final question now. And it is, there's a lot of talk about increased devolution to Cardiff and maybe a city deal in future. How do you feel that will affect the economy? I mean, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what a city deal is? Or? Yeah, so my understanding of it is that uh, it allows... Uh, UK government support Cardiff more as a uh, as a city region. Oh, so it's, right. instead of it just being like Cardiff and Newport and Bridgend and Blackwood, the, the entire region, which I understand is going to be something like one and a half, two million people. Mm-hmm. So it does, it kind of goes all the way up the valleys a bit, mm-hmm. it goes out past Newport uh, and, and Bridgend and whatever. So, you know, it's a much bigger area. But what it allows us to do is, um, from what I understand, make decisions collectively as a city region. So, you know, say, for example, we've got to talk about uh, transport to the east of the city. Yeah. And some of it goes into Newport's boundaries. Who makes the decision on that? Right. Yeah, is it Newport or is it Cardiff? We've got to go into, we've got to talk about uh, transport links or job creation in Ronda, Cun and Taft, but it affects both Ronda, Cun and Taft and Cardiff. Who makes the decision? RCT or Cardiff Council so actually this city deal will allow us to do a lot more of the kind of higher level thinking anyway that's my understanding of it Um, and for me it kind of it makes sense it makes economic sense I think people will obviously have a certain fear of a loss of identity of course uh, which I think is natural but you have to understand I think that actually most people who live anything more than like 20 minutes away from half an hour away from here don't care so if you ask someone from Paris Mm -hmm. if you told someone from from Paris you're you live in Bridgend it would just be easier to say I live in Cardiff you know so if you lived in Slough or Richmond or um, Milton Keynes and you went to Beijing and someone said you live in London you go yeah, 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 exactly. Because they don't—they're not going to care about your minor identity differences between Slough and London, or whatever. It's all one kind of thing. So, the further you remove yourself, the the less those kind of granular uh, differences make. You know, because obviously, you know, you're you're from Grange Town, you and know. exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you have a different. You you probably feel very very locally. Mm-hmm. There's a slightly different identity between Grange Town and say. Pont Cana. In Absolutely. fact, they, they, there's a huge difference between Grange Town and Pont Cana. Road, <laughs> exactly. Road, exactly. Road, exactly, exactly. But actually, yeah. when you're in London, you're from oh, Cardiff. Yeah. It's kind of like obviously we're, we're recording this the day before uh, the on the afternoon of the Wales Andorra game, and it's funny because they're always aggro between Cardiff City fans and Swansea City yeah. fans. But when the world's national team out, of you come together. Of course. And you get that with absolutely everything. You're always like, you jack and kind of thing. Yeah. But then when it's Wales, you come together. Because absolutely. you're playing something bigger than what you are. And, and you, a, you get that on absolutely everything. And I think this will benefit all of us. And it will, you know, it'll, it'll make decisions around things like the metro easier. Because obviously the metro will reach into a bunch of different areas and a bunch of different local authorities. And, you know, so... It would just make those kind of decisions easier, and it, you know, and I think we get, uh, from my understanding, we get a we get a bit of subsidy from UK government to enable that stuff to happen, um, and yeah, so you know, I, I need to read a lot more about it, um, but for me, it kind of makes sense with the rate at which Cardiff is growing. Mm-hmm. You know, in twenty years' time, there might not be a distinct boundary between Cardiff and Newport. Yeah, you know, the rate merging, aren't they? Yeah, yeah the so brawl is almost exactly. Connected. You know, so so then what? What it? You know, so in in London terms or in LA terms or in Berlin terms, Newport, and I know people from Newport probably don't want to hear this, but Newport's yeah. Yeah. effectively kind of almost a suburb of Cardiff. Or in twenty years, it will definitely be. Yeah. You know, it will be seen as whether you it'll know, be a city region. It will be like. Um, 
how Oakland and LA kind of that kind exactly of they are technically different places but fundamentally you and I see them as LA right, right. so uh, it's it's a really really difficult uh, um, a conversation to have locally sometimes because mm-hmm. people are strong and rightly so people are strong identities and we should be proud of where they're from absolutely but it's uh, I think as the city grows and start you know um, it will naturally we're going to have to start thinking uh, 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 and this kind of almost feeds into this there's been a lot of talk I don't know if you've come across it of um, we've got 22 counties in Wales originally there were 6 or 7 now there's yeah. talk of some of them coming back in together obviously that's kind of financial as well as yeah. other reasons as well but then this kind of all kind of feeds into it because so I know Cardiff and the Vale are looking to hook back up to make what was South Glamorgan yeah. and then so I'm not sure how far these discussions have gone on, but it just seems to be more cooperation, more coming back together again. It seems to be the way everything's going. And it is really, really weird sometimes of like, you know, they just seem, you know, like I was saying, I lived in Panath for a, for a handful of years and, and you know, Panath's like there. Yeah. I mean, we can look out a window and, and see... The church it, on top of the... T- oh, exactly, yeah. and it kind of felt weird that I could be from... I could be in a, in a different town in a different county... Mm-hmm. Get in my car for less than five minutes. I mean, less than five minutes, and be in a, another different county in another city. And that's just kind of you know. So Panath is again. Panath just feels like a natural extension of Cardiff Bay. Sometimes yeah. you know, it's kind of like. What was the barrage? You just walk up the hill. And you're well, there. that's it. I mean, I walk, you know, the barrage was my daily run route. No, yeah. it sounds like same for you. It's it's yeah, kind of daily yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's it. Yeah. I could I could run from Panath to Cardiff and back again in like half an hour so I mean, I mean, this, is, this is something that's always happened Landers is its own city which is its own village yeah. it's just been swallowed into what Cardiff is and it's just going to continue happening it that's is gonna, how it is I think we're going through what some have described as the biggest demographic shift in human history so for the first time ever mm-hmm. more people live in cities than don't yeah. so it's only natural that cities are growing at this rate and a lot of it's to do with like people don't want to live in the suburbs anymore or they're less likely to like previous generations like my parents generation their aim and goal by the time they were 40 50 was to be like five miles out the center big house four bedrooms garden that was the aim of that generation yeah whereas actually the the flats i lived in in uh panath marina half the people in there were retired because they were like you know what our kids have left there's no what point in having this, this massive house yeah let's sell it Get a small house in a re- uh, a small flat in a really nice place, place, and then we've got a park over the road. It's all about shared services. So you've got the park over the road. You've got the Starbucks or the Costa or whatever you want. The galleries. You don't need like a forty inch TV in your huge lounge because actually you've got a cinema over the road or whatever. So actually, people are coming to this, you know, understanding. And you look at people in London. Nobody there is like desperate to get to Watford. <laughs> no, exactly. Nobody's looking to, yeah. you know, it's it, people who live in these massive cities are very, very, like my sister lives in, in pretty much central London and she has got everything she wants uh, and, you know, for her, there's no dream of getting out of the city because she yeah. loves being able to walk to a gallery or to a bar or to a cafe or to a cinema within like five minutes. Yeah. So, and I think that's that's going to, as, as our generation's we're probably going to retain that ethos. I think so. You know, obviously there comes a point like if you have kids or whatever, you might think, well, a little bit more space. But, but as long as it's not dangerous, I think most people are quite happy to. So. Yeah. Cool. I think that just about wraps it up. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Well, we'll see you again soon, possibly. Good stuff. Look forward to it.